where is the con quantum control stack heading? And what can we do to accelerate its timeline towards practical quantum computing? Today I wanna to share with you our vision at Quantum Machines as we are thinking about these problems uh, and also tell you what we are focusing our developments on in order to uh, um, accelerate the progress in the field and in order to make this vision a reality. So the quantum control stack is, uh, that includes four different uh, layers. We have the quantum processors or the QPUs. Then we have the control hardware, the control software, and then of course the application layers, uh, in which I also include uh, the uh, higher level programming and development tools. So now, up until uh, recent years, most of the conversation was focused really on the QPUs, where a lot of the, uh, uh, all the magic actually happens, all the quantum stuff happens, uh, and also where most of the development had to and still needs to be done. And then of course on the application layer, uh, the top layer, which is of course what the end goal of quantum computing is, uh, to run qu useful quantum algorithms. And it's only in recent uh, years that uh, the conversation has started to shift and uh, these control layers have started to take up more and more space in the conversation because these layers really sit in the middle there where they can really push performance uh, optimization and uh, also increase uh, the, uh, the uh, productivity of research and development. So let's dive a little bit deeper into these two uh, layers of the stack and see what are the different components of these, uh, of these layers. So the control hardware can be split to two uh, main uh, components or layers. We have the analog front end, and then we have the quantum controller. The analog front end uh, is the interface to the QPU. That's basically what generates all the signals that drive the dynamics of the QPU, and also measures the, the, the QPU, measures the qubit states. So this includes all the digital to analog converters, the attenuators, the amplifiers, the, uh, the cables, uh, and also the sensors that measure the quantum system. This layer, of course, needs to be highly scalable, um, and it also needs to provide clean signals uh, with good signal integrity that, that does not limit fidelity. That's very important, of course. Then the quantum controller is sort of the brain of the uh, control hardware. So that's the component that's, that, that, that is responsible for generating or orchestrating the entire uh, sequence that uh, is the, uh, basically the quantum program or the quantum circuit. So then the interface to the quantum controller is an assembly level language uh, that describes exactly what the hardware does. Okay, and that's, that's important. So typically this is a pulse level language. Uh, and the reason is because, you know, this is the lowest level access that we, we will ever get to the quantum machine. And we, we need uh, pulse level language, uh, sorry, pulse level uh, access, of course, to the machine, even if only for calibrations. Therefore, this, this assembly level language is typically a pulse level language. And then the control software then on top of that uh, is responsible for the calibrations and characterizations that are done on top of this uh, pulse level language as well as the compilation stack. And of course also orchestrating complex, uh, uh, control, complex um, uh, application flows and execution flows. Another very important part of the stack are classical computer resources. Okay, and this is because uh, almost any application, or in fact also calibrations, uh, need to rely heavily on classical processing, as we'll see later today. In fact, it's also very important to add, uh, to have qua uh, sorry, classical compute resources uh, very close to the QPU, okay, in, in high proximity, and even inside the quantum controller itself, okay? This is something that we at Quantum Machine uh, pioneered with our unique uh, past processor architecture and approach, and we're pushing very, very strongly on. Um, and, um, and just to clarify what I mean by that, these are classical processing that needs to happen uh, in real time, that is with precise timing control on the nanosecond level, and allow things like mid-circuit measurements uh, with uh, feedback-based response, uh, with sometimes feedback latencies on the order of, of, of hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, so we're going to see examples of this uh, and how, how important uh, this is uh, later on in this, in this demo. Uh, but this is the, generally the, the quantum control stack, okay? 
Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, on top of this, we have the, uh, the application layer. Uh, so the ultimate goal, I would say, of the, of the quantum control uh, layer or the uh, quantum control stack would be to allow application uh, developers to design applications and run applications with highest productivity and also uh, but, uh, achieving basically uh, the, the most performance out of the underlying QPUs and also underlying uh, classical processing. At QM, we are completely focused on quantum control. So our mission is to bring out the best out of any QPU and to achieve uh, fastest time to results in quantum development. So we are developing what we call the quantum orchestration platform. Uh, this is basically the aim of this quantum orchestration platform is to provide a control solution to uh, the best and biggest QPUs out there. Um, and these are the, the, the different components of our quantum orchestration platform. So first we have our quantum control hardware uh, that has, of course, um, a very scalable and modular analog front end. And then the heart of our technology, which is the quantum, uh, or sorry, the pulse processor. So uh, the pulse processor is uh, a new processor that is embedded in the quantum, sorry, the quantum control hardware. Uh, and it's responsible for the pulse generation, the quantum measurements, the uh, entire orchestration of the uh, quantum circuit or the quantum program. And then again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, classical compute resources that need to run in real time. So embedded in the quantum program. Beyond the pulse processor, we've integrated uh, a bunch of other uh, cool things into our control hardware like coprocessors, stream processing capabilities, high bandwidth networking, as well as uh, storage and caching. And we'll talk about some of these uh, features later on uh, also in, in this talk. Then the interface to our uh, control hardware is uh, our very powerful and very intuitive programming language, Qua. So this is a first of its kind programming language that combines and really allows you to uh, interleave quantum and classical commands in the same program, in the same code uh, that, again, run in real time. Uh, and this also includes the control flow, and this is all done on the pulse level. On top of this, uh, in our control software layer, we have uh, integration to higher layers of the stack. Uh, so, so for example, integration with OpenCASM 3 that we're going to release uh, in early 2022, uh, as well as Entropy, our calibration uh, and QPU abstraction uh, platform that, and, and, and all our um, open source libraries that we're developing together with our customers. But today I wanna to focus on the right side. I wanna uh, focus on the right side of the stack and specifically on the integration of classical processing into quantum. Because this is something that at quantum machines we're pushing uh, to the limit. Uh, because we think that the integration of classical processing is a key uh, for optimizing uh, performance, for opening new possibilities in quantum control, and also for uh, accelerating runtimes, as we will see in some of the examples. Just to give you a feeling of why classical processing is so important in quantum, so if you look at almost any application or any calibration, uh, it typically involves a complex flow of quantum and classical processing. So this could start from uh, pre-processing, like uh, circuit op uh, compilation, optimization, and other things that need to run on the classical server layer. And then the, the server layer generates the pulse level program to be run on the quantum machine. So this gets sent to the uh, quantum controller, and then the controller executes it. And sometimes the program itself that needs to run on the quantum machine includes this real-time processing that I mentioned before. That's where we need the, uh, the, the, the real-time classical compute. So one example for this could be uh, exploring uh, quantum error correction protocols, uh, such as this repetition code, and there are many other examples. We'll see some examples for this, as I mentioned uh, later on. All right, and then the quantum controller, while it's uh, performing the circuit on the, on the QPU, it's of course performing also the measurements and then sending the measurements results back to the uh, server layer that then performs further classical processing like evaluating a cost function, optimization, doing classical analysis of, uh, for in, 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 in calibrations, uh, extracting Hamiltonian parameters, et cetera. And this typically ends up with the uh, classical compute resources or the server layer, then generating another program that needs to run on the uh, quantum machine 
or you know, updating parameters of an existing uh, loaded program in the, in the control. So classical processing uh, integration is super important, both on the real-time uh, uh, layer and also on the, uh, on the, on the server uh, layer. Um, and so I want to give you now several examples of how we at Quantum Machines uh, are providing these capabilities um, and are pushing them to the limit. So first I want to focus on the real-time processing aspect. These are done again on, the, on our Pulse processor. Uh, and I want to look at several examples uh, of uh, classical processing, real-time classical processing that is done to open new possibilities such as for active state preparation and, and quantum error correction. Then look at uh, optimize, uh, examples that optimize performance such as fast embedded calibrations. And lastly to talk about uh, speed up uh, run times uh, where we're, we're going to look at the uh, the CLOPS benchmark recently um, um, announced and defined by IBM. All right, so let's start with uh, active state preparation. So state preparation is of course very important in quantum computing. We wanna prepare quantum states with high fidelity. Um, now there are several ways, uh, many different protocols that one can use uh, to use active control in order to uh, optimize state preparation. Um, the simplest one would be to simply measure your quantum state, measure your qubits, and based on the results, apply conditional operations to bring it to the state that you want your quantum, uh, your qubits to be at. Um, these types of, uh, of, um, of protocols are bread and butter uh, for, the, uh, for the pulse processor and also for QA. You see you can program these uh, protocols in a few lines of code in QA and run them with best performance on the quantum, or, or sorry, on the pulse processor. Um, we typically, for uh, active reset, for example, of a qubit, where our system uh, provides feedback latency times of, uh, that can go down below 200 nanoseconds, which uh, for all we know is the best performance in the, in the field. And this is just the simplest kind of protocols. Uh, you can do something more fancy to reach higher preparation fidelity, such as repeatancy success uh, protocols. These are actually important for many other things like magic state distillation, um, and, and, and other things in, in, in quantum computing. Um, and so here, as you can see, there is a more complicated control flow. We actually keep measuring and measuring the qubits and applying conditional operations until we reach the state that we want to reach uh, um, with our QPU. So um, again, this is bread and butter for the OPX. Um, you program it in a few lines of code and it runs on the pulse processor with best performance uh, in the field. Again, about 200 uh, nanosecond feedback latency to run this, uh, these kind of repetitive success loops. And you can do even more. You can uh, do, this is a, a more scalable uh, for a larger number of qubits protocols where you uh, run a sequence of measurements and you perform what's called dynamic uh, thresholding. So basically, uh, we're updating the discrimination threshold uh, of our state, uh, state discrimination as we keep, um, as we keep um, accumulating more measurement results. And this basically uh, allows us to optimize the fidelity of the preparation, uh, even if you have many qubits. So again, pulse processor can do it with best performance in the market, with uh, latency. So you see that this protocol involves classical processing because we need to update in a uh, kind of a Bayesian update manner, the thresholds, the discrimination thresholds uh, as we keep measuring the qubits. Um, so you have to have real-time processing to do that and that's uh, super easy with the, uh, with Qua and the pulse processor. Um, this leads me to yet another state preparation uh, protocol that uh, was developed in our very cool collaboration with QControl and uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, we're actually, we now have um, integration with QControl uh, via Python and Qua, uh, which is very cool because our customers can enjoy the power of both uh, the platforms. And in this specific collaborations with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, um, this integration was used to run uh, this state machine that you see uh, on the picture on the left here, which is again, a very complicated state machine that needs to run in real time on the pulse processor and needs to be programmed from software and played with in software. Uh, here, actually, this protocol takes into account the, uh, the leakage to higher level of the qubits, so the F states, so non-computational states. Uh, and this allowed us to reach higher state preparation fidelities, as you can see in the figure on the, on the right, um, as well as much faster run times, because now when you can prepare your states so much better and so much faster, you can run certain calibrations like optimal pulse calibrations are much faster. So 
100 times faster in this case, um, as well as cleaner data. So I really like this image because it shows um, what, you know, these are rubby oscillations that you get. Uh, the white line here shows what you get when you don't do active reset, and the blue line here shows what you get when you do uh, perform active reset. So you see much cleaner data uh, because we can run experiments so much faster now. All right, so this was state preparation or state, um, you know, active state preparation. Uh, next, I want to talk about error correction. Now, this is a very uh, deep subject, of course. We won't have time to go uh, into, uh, uh, into this uh, too deeply. Um, we actually, uh, however, have a talk about this, an entire talk about quantum error correction and how the quantum orchestration platform uh, really allows exploring different quantum error correction protocols very flexibly from software on Thursday, so please join in us for, uh, for this. Um, for this talk, I'll just briefly mention that, of course, quantum error correction protocols rely on mid-circuit measurements and feedback-based response, such as in this uh, rep um, repetition code shown here. Um, there are ways to optimize these types of uh, repetition codes and surface codes um, with active control flow and classical processing. Uh, one could, you, could do, for example, adapt, adaptive um, error syndrome measurements that could shorten the time of the, uh, of the repetition cycle as well as improve readout fidelity. Um, and we've implemented such protocols in QA. Again, this is um, very easily done using you know, tens of lines of code instead of thousands of lines of code in other uh, systems. And uh, I won't go over it too much, but um, the idea is that it heavily relies on classical processing that we can do in QA to update um, uh, things like the error syndrome measurement protocols in real time. Okay, next example are embedded calibration. This is a very nice example because uh, if we can run calibrations fast enough um, and in fact also use active feedback to correct the parameters the, to the new calibrated parameters fast enough, uh, we can make sure that the systems are calibrated the entire time and they do not fluctuate around because we're running calibration so fast that we can keep the performance of the, of the machine uh, constant uh, and up and running. And we don't need to also ha have downtime of the system for calibrations. So uh, this is just an example from, again, from the Lawrence Livermore National Lab where um, they used to run this Ramsey calibration, which is a, a qubit uh, frequency calibration in about 900 minutes with their previous platform. And now they run this, um, this calibration in about two minutes. And we don't need to actually run this entire graph. We can sample it and using fast feedback, we can actually um, very quickly um, adapt the, uh, to the right parameters of the qubit. All right, finally, uh, I want to talk about uh, CLOPS optimization. And uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, Blake, maybe you can correct me if I'm not. Uh, yeah. Um, so CLOPS is this uh, really, uh, every time I'm saying this, uh, I'm, I, keep, you know, I keep thinking about the Jewish food, uh, sorry, CLOPS, uh, which is uh, this thing right here. I know it looks tedious. But uh, it's actually very delicious. My grandmother used to make it. Um, and so, but in CLOPS, we run sequences of circuits, uh, the parameters of which uh, depend on the previous circuit results. Okay, um, this was recently defined by IBM. I think it's a really great uh, benchmark because it really starts to put a lot of emphasis on the control performance and, uh, and the speed, the runtime of applications, real applications. Um, so we run these circuits. Now, typically in traditional execution models, uh, what happens is that we're, we, we can be limited by communication and software. Um, so it looks something like this. You see there that we're running a single circuit which translates to a single pass level program that needs to be sent to the control, uh, control hardware in the quantum machine and run. And then the controller generates the results, as we said before, which can take, you know, it needs to send them back to the server layer. This could be orders of milliseconds, uh, also generating new parameters, could be orders of milliseconds, and sending new programs or new parameters, which also can take uh, milliseconds. So the dependency between one circuit to another uh, could be on the order of, of milliseconds, and this could dominate uh, runtimes. What uh, our pass processor model execution, execution model allows us to do is to generate new parameters on the fly in the quantum program so that we can run the entire sequence in a single QA program, 
Okay, so it looks something like this. In fact, in the Klops benchmark, one needs to randomize numbers uh, on the fly, and we have these capabilities in the past processor, so we can randomize uh, new parameters as uh, on the fly, and run. In fact, we don't. We can run not just one line as a single co co program, but several. Uh, but uh, in any case, this really optimizes uh, performance. We are now actually we started benchmarking it on our uh, actual system, and we are. Um, we preliminary results reaching uh, performance that are higher than uh, 10K for, for our clubs benchmarking. Again, these are pre preliminary results. We actually believe that we can do much better with this uh, execution model. All right. <clears throat> now, I talked a lot about real-time processing, um, but it's also very important to, to, to talk about the, uh, tight integration with, classical, uh, with the classical server layer. Okay, so... Um, as I mentioned before, beyond the past processor, we've integrated a lot of uh, new cool features into our hardware that allow us to, uh, to do this tight integration with the classical server layer. Um, so first of all, we have coprocessors that allow us to, uh, to do pre-processing of the data before sending them to the uh, classical layer, okay? Um, and you can do it actually while the uh, quantum program is running. Um, then we've uh, added high bandwidth networking, 100 gigabit Ethernet networking uh, to send data back to the server. Um, stream processing, so we can send data in streams, meaning that while the, uh, the, 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 the quantum machine is taking data and running more circuits, we typically need to run many shots. We continuously send the data of previous shots to the server that it can start um, uh, processing them, them. Okay, so this can optimize the loop even further. And of course, pre-compilation, uh, where uh, we pre-compile program and then we can override parameters, we can override uh, uh, waveforms and so on. Um, last thing that we're working on right now is uh, also caching of programs so that we can uh, send batches of programs uh, to the quantum controller. Okay, so I hope I convince you that at quantum machines we're really pushing this quantum classical integration to the limit. Um, and with that, uh, let me really thank you for uh, joining me uh, here, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes. Unique question. So, what I understand is that you are trying to promote co-locating classical and the quantum processor. Yes. yes. Do you mean like? for the classical processor to be at the low temperature environment? Uh, so this is another thing that we are thinking of, but uh, at the moment, this is the classical processing is at room temperature. So it is not the latencies of going uh, into the fridge and back that are today, at least the uh, still the bottleneck, that, that's what we believe. Very nice architecture, but it can also support multiple quantum chips as well. Yes, uh, it actually already does. So you can you can connect with what we call multi quantum machines. It's another, another layer in our stack that allows you with a single, let's say, a rack of controllers, a couple of racks of controller to to um, control several QPUs. Yes. Yeah. Um, hopefully, we solve them all. In fact, <laughs> uh, yes, this is a big problem that um, yeah everybody's of course working on, and we believe that we. We cracked it, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I was going to ask um, more about, uh, have you benchmarked your system against other open source projects that do the quantum optical integration, like uh, Zach and Keycore, which are enabled by the UIR intermediate representation, um, or like the QDK? So you're talking about hardware platforms, or? Well, no, software like compiler tool chains that express programs as hybrid circuit uh, like classical and quantum. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a little bit higher in the stack compared to us. So actually we can use these open source uh, um, tools to sit on top of our platform, um, you know, and because everything I talked about today is uh, still at the, from the past level down, right? Uh, there are also open source tools that go that full stack software. Yes, right, but like, Everything I talked about uh, today, it's it's you know it's it's the runtimes of you know the, the once you already like compile the program, and you have the, uh, the yeah, the past level programs right. So. Yes. 
Actually, I'll just mention, uh, continue just one more sentence about this question. In our uh, higher layers of the, of the stack, which I didn't talk about so much, um, we are working a lot on integrations with many different open source platforms, and also with collaborators like QControl, for instance. So, um, yeah, we believe that this layer of the stack should really be a collaboration of this entire quantum community because uh, one would want to integrate it at the end of the day, you know, best of breed tools, software tools from the entire quantum community, some of which are, you know, application dependent and so on. And we want to enable this, this entire, like the, all open source tools and other software tools to be run on top of our platform. Yes? I think Mark is on my question. Okay. Yeah, so we allow to actually integrate diff like different QPUs, and then everything is programmed from Qua. Now, Qua is a pass level language, so that any software tool that sits higher in the stack and, for example, optimizes compilation or performing optimal control of the pass shapes, all of that can sit on top of the platform. And yes, the answer is yes, we, um, we count on tools like that um, to sit on top of our platform. We're actually working with some of our customers to implement the integration, such as we did with, uh, with QControl, to uh, basically provide our customers with uh, larger and larger parts of the stack. All right, so thank you very much. And